Go. Okay. Um, right. This is um, a social history of Ireland from antiquity to 1700. Uh, this is part four, and it's called The Coming of the Anglo-Normans. In this picture, you can see this is uh, quite a romantic picture of what is known as Trim Castle, which is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, castles in Ireland um, that was built by the Anglo-Normans. And um, we will be having a look at it later on, um, as it would have looked uh, at the time. The um, in our previous episode, we dealt with the with the Vikings who were roaming or rampaging around Ireland for uh, about a couple of hundred years previously. That was that's up to about one thousand AD, roughly, and um, they the uh, and the impact that they they had on, on our society uh, was actually quite limited. We've got very few, uh, uh, very few Viking names. There's one or two, like Sinnet, which is a, which is a has a Viking origin or or Norse origin, should I say? But the but the other, um, but well, we have surprisingly few. Uh, Viking root names or Norse root names um, left in Ireland, and the DNA seems to back that back that up. In fact, uh, however, the the Norse did settle um, on the coasts quite a lot, and they they had um, established five by by one thousand. There were there were five or so very strong Irish um, towns that had set up. The, the, the Vikings brought towns to, to Ireland. The only, the only urban, semi-urban centers before that were around the monasteries. Um, uh, the, the Vikings actually bought proper towns and they set them up in Dublin and in Wexford and in Waterford and in Cork and in Limerick, in, in, those were the, were the most su successful ones. And, um, but beyond that, they didn't really have a huge amount of, of influence. They, they certainly changed the, the, the way in which Irish warfare was raged from waged it was uh, prior to, 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 to the Norse, it was more ritualistic and uh, possibly uh, more to do with cattle raiding, less, less, less blood spilt. This all changes during the Viking era or possibly just before the Viking era. We're not quite sure about that. The, it, it could have it could have been that the that the, 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 there was a gen, general increase in the in the amount of violence anyway but um, but certainly certainly the the Norse uh, didn't didn't exactly help on on those on those grounds so there was there was quite we know from from archaeological remains like the the, the sort of wounds inflicted and wounds inflicted on captives and so on and so forth that that um that the level of violence um did it did increase quite a lot in the in in, in the viking era um but the but the vikings didn't really get a foothold now you can, can contrast that to to what how they dealt with england now a lot of it of why they were unsuccessful in Ireland, people have been speculating about, but, um, but my argument would be that Irish society was very decentralized. Uh, there were chieftains or kings, as they called themselves. There were several layers of kings, in fact, um, up to 180 of them uh, in the entire island. And, um, there are some that were like over kings and some that were trying to be high kings. Um, 
but it wasn't like Anglo say if you compare and contrast with Anglo-Saxon society, you can see that the Anglo-Saxons uh, had several had several just just uh, when the Vikings first arrived, there were just about maybe three or four um, or the most half a dozen kingdoms and but they were very quite centralized kingdoms and, and they collapsed very quickly. Uh, the, the main difference um, with the Irish, uh, so the, so the, the, um, the, the, the Vikings or the Norse were able to take advantage of that in England uh, and they were able to, to settle uh, in quite extensive areas, for instance, especially in northeast England, uh, the in in Ireland that didn't 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 really work because because you you had to you know, okay you could get a treaty with one king, but then you had several other hostile kings who were right next to you, and then you maybe made an alliance with one of them, and then you'd find find you fallen out with with some with with the first one, and therefore it wasn't really conducive to to settlement at all. Um, now the, the Irish society was Christian, and um, it had been it had been Christianized at the end of the end of the Roman era, and um, and it had become actually quite a big centre of what's known as monastic. Uh, Christianity, uh, which was, which was a um, a quite a particular Irish form or or, or Gaelic form of um, of 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 Christianity, even though it was it was still aligned to the to the Church of Rome. Uh, now, Irish our society was also um, there were there were quite a lot of differences um, in England. They were starting to use coins, um, especially for the the kings were using coins to raise armies and so on and so forth. Whereas in Ireland, coinage outside the Viking towns where it was used mainly in, in terms of slave trade and stuff um, the coinage wasn't really being used at all uh, what was being used was was a system of exchange uh, based around cattle so so uh, so the primary way of measuring one's wealth was was not in land and it wasn't in coins so so it it didn't really those those aspects didn't didn't really feature at all. So it was like the uh, the it was how how many how many cattle have I got and and if I've got so many cattle I give I give uh, some some cattle to my to my clients to my friends and they give me they they swear their allegiance to me and so on and so forth and. Um, and that was, and that was basically how the how the society was organised. There was also quite a lot of, um, there was less social stratification and quite a bit of social mobility was going on. Um, now this is this is a, a direct. Um, this is starting to diverge. Early Saxon society had been a little bit similar, but. The Saxons had developed towns, and they'd also developed these centralized kingdoms. And then, as they started to conform to the feudal uh, norm of of uh, of Western Europe, which was developing mainly with the Franks and the later the Normans, the 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 changes in in England, um, especially after the Norman invasion of, of 1066, they become, become much more um, much more pronounced. And uh, the especially you've got very centralized, you just want one centralized kingdom, 
which was the um, which was the the Plantagenet line um, ruled by the Plantagenet line, starting with with William the Conqueror, and um, and unlike France, which was which is a very weak monarchy at the time, um, England. England, derived from the from from the Normans in Normandy, uh, was was a was was a very very strong kingdom, and you start to see the division in society. Like it's no longer the vast majority of the people are 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 um, free peasants. No, this is this starts to change very radically. Under under the under the Anglo Normans, you start to see a division between the people who who fought, the meaning the knights, um, the people who prayed, meaning the the, uh, the clergy, and and the and the people who worked, which was basically the the, the peasantry. And then there were the people in the towns who didn't really fit into those categories. Um, and uh, they were starting to develop um, uh, the, as I say, the, the towns were actually starting to develop, I'd say, very early forms of capitalism. We, we know this because um, monetization, mon wait, well, I'll try to say that again, monetize, monetization of the uh, economy during the 12th century we have records uh, in the in the town of Gloucester that people were actually exchanging coins for bread and and wine or bread and and beer um, now that is that is quite a, a, a significant degree of monetization uh, because nothing like that it was in the art and we didn't didn't even have any coins at all outside the outside the uh, the former former Viking towns now now Gaelia size um, and um, and so and as I say you had had all this um, the system of exchange was 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 based around around cattle. So, um, so, so they, th these were the, um, th th this is what was going on. So can we have slide two, please? That's it, okay. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, um, the Normans, uh, they were actually the Normans, literally Northmen, yes, and they were they were descended from from Vikings again, or or or, or Norsemen. Um, they'd established a duchy of Normandy, which was officially tied to the Capetian crown in 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 Paris, uh, but was more or less independent from quite an early early date um, and they had completely adopted uh, French language, French names and French cult culture and and the feudal and the feudal arrangements which were becoming the norm in France at the time. Um, they were renowned the the uh, the Norman knights were renowned for their uh prowess and 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 their aggression they were known for being very aggressive uh and very minded towards conquest um and um and they had already subdued the neighboring duchy of Brittany uh which had been uh Turned into a sort of tributary state, and um, and then they conquered the Kingdom of England in 1066, 
and uh, and then added that to their to their possessions. And simultaneously, I think it was one of uh, William the Conqueror's brothers went off and decided to set up a kingdom, another kingdom in in Sicily, and um, which which uh, conquered the whole of southern Italy as well as Sicily, and then. And then they went across the Mediterranean to attack Byzantium or Constantinople, uh, which was which is part of the Eastern Eastern Roman Empire or, or Byzantine Empire, um, and that that is quite a um, an achievement. And and they and they were, as I say, they were completely Frenchified, but they still um, they still had some. Uh, Viking technology in their their ships. That's that's why they ended up in Sicily of all places, um, and and also what took them over to to England. Um, by the mid twelfth century, the the, um, the 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 northernmost of the two Anglo Norman or the two North, shall I say Norman dynasties had had been set up in um one in england as i say and one in sicily we won't bother about about the one in in sicily it's not really relevant to to what we're talking about but the, but the northernmost one is very relevant and um as i say it was established by william the the conqueror in England in in 1066, and it uh, also held the the, the the Duchy of Normandy, and within a short space of time, it had also acquired the um, the or entered into alliance or through marriage, it had conjoined with the House of Anjou, uh, which is slightly further south of Normandy uh, and the and the very large um, province of Aquitaine which is which is uh, basically where Gas um, Gascony and Bordeaux and and um, uh, that that whole stretch of very very fertile land um, on the on the west coast of France, and um, and as well as that, they were also making inroads into Wales, and they were also making inroads into Scotland. There, the ones that went into Scotland uh, had to eventually they had to give allegiance to the Scottish king, but the ones in Wales were less restricted. And we'll be dealing with these ones um, a bit later on. So, um, so, so the the um, we can we can we can probably move on to the to the um, the the next the next picture. Yeah. So, um, if you look at the map on the on the left, I'm showing you the two maps simultaneously because it gives you an idea of the impact of the of the Anglo Normans in Ireland. Um, you have you have um, the, the the image or the map on the on the left shows Ireland round about uh, one thousand. Um, or 1014, which is just after the the, uh, the Battle of Clontarf, which is which is a, 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 a very famous and supposedly a decisive battle in in Irish history, and um, uh, you can see th all, all the kingdoms are are in the various colours. There, you have um, Ulidia in the north. East, um, east of the country, that that one is um, that that's been there for a long time. But by this point, 
it's the remnants of the old Ulster, the old Ulster Kingdom, which used to be much bigger than that. Um, but at this at this time, and in fact, it had been been this way for a long time. It was it was um, it was hanging in there. The the um, and um, despite much internal and external strife, it was just about hanging in there. Uh, the the northern Inyel. Um, and the southern Inyel were two branches of the same dynasty that you can see them in the ones right in the middle of the country and the other one is up in the northwest. Um, and the and the northern Inyel had fallen out with each other and couldn't really decide who is the who is the high king amongst them. And the southern Inyel had by the sh short period after the after the battle of of Klontorf had had completely and utterly disintegrated and there is no there is no higher higher authority and it was slowly being eaten up by its its neighbors um, the kingdom of of Oriel had originally been much bigger than this, but it was it too was sort of collapsing, though it did expand in another direction later on. Um, and um, the the um, the kingdom of Brefne, which was set up by the Aurochs, they were an offshoot of the Connacht dynasty, the Connor. If you can see that, that's in the far left, far um, far west. There, um, that was being dominated by a, a, a family of or a dynastic family known as the O'Connors, uh, and then there were the O'Rourkes of Breffney, who were related to them, shall we say, um, but independently related to them. The, the Inyel, as I say, were falling apart and squabbling amongst each other, as were the Northern Inyel, but the Northern Inyel got their act together uh, again, whereas the Southern Inyel didn't. And, and then we have the um, Kingdom of Leinster. Now, this is, this is starting to become quite important. This is um, the formerly dominant dynasty there was, was called the Un... E, e, e um, and they are replaced by the E Hensele. And the and the E, e Hensele um, lead to the next um, development in, in Ireland's Ireland's history. Um, and um, in in Munster in the south. Um, you can see um, there was there was basically the O'Briens were running uh, Munster for the most part. There was also a new um, a new a new dynasty was starting to challenge that. There were probably a couple of a couple of dynasties were were challenging that, um, but but the but the main power in in Munster, uh, around this period, was the O'Brien O'Brien dynasty, and they were descendants of Brian Baru, who was the one uh, killed at the Battle of, of Clontarf, along with most of his um, his male uh, immediate family. Uh, the so um, so that had made a big. A big impact on the O'Briens because the O'Briens thought that they were going to be the the, the high kings of Ireland, but uh, that didn't that didn't work out because they were all killed at the battle, basically. Um, and then you have the have the have the Viking towns now. The Viking towns were they, they were no longer Viking towns. They were pretty much everybody was speaking Irish by this point. Um, they had some. Um, some Nor Norse or, Ar or Viking descent, um, but they were they were more or less um, intermarried and um, subjected often to well su subjected directly to 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 the um, to the local Irish Irish kings as 
tributary states. They were no longer independent. Okay, so, um, and in, in the 12th century, um, th this, this period was known as the Great Irish Interregnum, and, and a lot of people co commented on it being an interregnum, um, not only inside Ireland, but also outside Ireland. They said, uh, I have no idea who's, who's in, in charge there at the moment. That period lasted roughly from the 1016 to 1072. After 1072, you start to see the emergence of the O'Connors, try to of that so Connacht in, in the west. There, they they try and make a an impact on Ireland, a bit like the O'Briens had in the previous century. And um, Turlough O'Connor and his son Rory made a few uh, further tentative, but not that significant steps towards setting up a centralized high kingdom. For instance, we, we know that, they, that they, he built some fortresses, um, that's Turlock O'Connor, he built some fortresses. He also supposed to have uh, mounted some of his men on horseback, um, which sounds impressive. Oh, he's building castles. Well, actually none of these fortifications remain or they're, they're just basic earthworks. And um, the the um, and the and the men mounted on horseback would have just been either mounted infantry or very light scout type cavalry. They were not they were not armored knights by any stretch of the imagination. So um, and and he also had to go at building roads as well. So um, but once again. What, what, what was meant in Ireland by a road was, was not what um, it would have meant uh, in England, say, uh, Anglo-Norman England, building the King's Highway. No, it wouldn't have been like that. It would have been just um, putting together a, um, a connection of, of very basic, um, uh, pathways, um, you know, connected by fords or by um, causeways across uh, bogs or whatever things like this. Here, it was it was nothing, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing that that spectacular. Okay, so there were some changes going on in the church, which we should talk about. Now, this is quite important actually because the. Uh, what was happened in, in Europe, which had brought about the start of what we would call the High Middle Ages or the, or the um, feudal system, was um, it had conjo conjoined with, a, with a, some changes in the church known as the Gregorian reforms. Now, up until this, this point, the, um, the priests, you know, they, they, they normally got married and things like this here. Um, the Gregorian form, the forms put, a, put an end to that. They also, they also um, it, it becomes much more rigid. There are diff new orders are brought out, the, the uh, um, Augustines and the, um, and the, and the Cistercian monks, um, and and the um, and the and tithes are established, which is which is a special tax paid to the as, as well as the tax you had to pay to your lord or your king. You also had to pay a, a, every everybody who lived in Christendom had to pay a tithe to 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 Rome. Um, so, so these were some of the of the changes that were being brought about, and they they were also start uh, and they were starting to um, to introduce a very well a, a, a much more severe version of Christianity than had been uh, permitted up until up until that point, and especially in Ireland because the Irish. Uh, had m multiple marriages. You're allowed to to marry several people, 
and um, and if you were in a in a monastery, the monasteries continued there were a lot of lay monks and in some cases by this period there were even uh, lay abbots um, and that was definitely against the Gregorian the spirit of the Gregorian reforms. Um, a famous saint in Ireland uh, in, in the build-up to, to, to this era is known as Saint Malachi. He lived uh, approximately 1094 to 1148. He was initially the ba abbot at Bangor, um, which was a um, abbey in the in the north, um, in the Ulidia territory, and then in the northeast. Um, and later he became Bishop of Armagh, which was probably the most um, important bishopric in Ireland, derived from St. Patrick goes all the way back to him, uh, was also we are told at least. And, um, and so it, he, he, he got the best or the most influential bishop job in, in, in Ireland by, by taking the bishopric of Armagh. Um, now he, he's the first Irish cleric of high status to try and apply the Gregorian reforms and the Roman liturgy, which is another part of the Gregorian forms. So, so um, that's the, the Latin liturgy and so on and so forth. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Irish church, and, and he does this through a series of synods. He doesn't do it through force. Um, he, he was quite a, quite a mild character in the sense that, I mean, he was obviously was quite taken with these Gregorian reforms, but um, he, tried to, he tried to do it in a way that wasn't going to rub too many people's um, backs up. And so he, he introduced these, um, he, did, he did it through a series of synods where, where he collected all, all the clerics in the country, all the big clerics in the country, and, and then said, we've got to start implementing uh, some of these, some of these changes, and so on and so forth, and then they had a talk about it, and they went back again and did some of the things and didn't do the other ones, and so on and so forth. And then they, um, so there's several of these synods he had, um, and he also helped to establish the Cistercians and the Augustinians. The Irish, the old Irish style of monastery was starting to disappear. Um, and these sort of um, continental style ones were, were starting to take their place. Um, and um, the Cistercians are the monks in the, in, the white, in the white coats, by the way. The Benedictines are the ones in the black cloaks and Cistercians are the ones in the white. Um, so he, he also stopped some secularizing practices that were going on about the lay abbots that I was talking about, for instance. And he also established that Irish bishoprics were to at last achieve primacy over the abbeys. Um, and that's quite uh, important because the, it, prior to that, the abbeys had been more important in many cases than the than the bishops so so that all all starts to change quite significantly and irish irish monasteries diminish from this point in in importance this is even before the the normans um set or the anglo normans set foot in in ireland um he also tried to change some of the marital practices and the free free wheeling, um, or more of free wheeling attitudes the Irish had to uh, sexuality and so on and so forth. But he didn't really achieve that very much. Um, he, then he went on uh, on his way to Rome to broadcast his achievements and say, oh, look what I've done in, in Ireland. 
um, and that that uh, that that brings us up to date with with what's happening in the rest of Europe. But uh, he died on the way at Clairvaux in in France, and he he, he never got to Rome. Now, a bit later on, there's there's quite an important figure takes over um, as Pope in, in Rome. And he's, he's Pope Adrian IV. He's the first and only English Pope. He took office in 1154. And now he's actually quite an interesting character. A lot of people in Ireland, a lot of people are, are sort of a little bit prejudice and they say oh he was English he was English and that's why he did what he, he did um, it doesn't necessarily work we know that he was very poor background he, um, he, he so he was Anglo-Saxon he wasn't a um, his, his his birth name was Breakspear um, and he was he, he was he was he was he was actually from a very poor poor background um, and he would have been, he would have considered himself to be an Anglo-Saxon rather than a, than a Norman. And he may have even resented the Normans. We don't know. But, but he, he was certainly the first and only Pope to come out of England. And he took office, as I say, and a year later, he writes a papal bull, which was known as the Laudabilite. And um, this document, it was based on the fake Donation of Constantine document uh, from an earlier period. And we know this, this is a fake, doc, fake document that um, alleged that, that the Emperor Constantine had granted the, the, the Pope the, the, the right to, um, to award award um, award land to um, uh, to 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 secular secular um, kings, uh, but but he, he, the laudability document arguably, and it, have to, it has to be said arguably because uh, they uh, subsequent popes and earlier popes would have disagreed with that. Um, but in the phraseology, it seems to grant Henry II, who is the Plantagenet or Anglo-Norman King of England, rule over Ireland. Um, and he, he dies quite early on. He's, 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 he's in office in 1154 and he's dead by 1159. Um, and um, and the his successor Alexander the Third, interestingly enough, he contested the wording's ambiguous nature um, with with Henry, and he said in, when Henry had already invaded Ireland, he said, "Hey, hang on a minute, that that isn't what it says here." Um, and um, uh, and. In fact, we can we can back that up because er, even earlier on, the Anglo Normans had already had a had a go at at um, at doing doing this because um, the Pope Eugenius the the third actually uh, actually intervened to to refuse um, a grant to um, to the to the to the Anglo Normans to invade Ireland. So, um, so as I say, the it, it was an unfortunate, uh, uh, unfortunate document. We don't really know if it was intentional or not. Given his background, possibly not. Um, but he he definitely uh, made it ambiguous, and and that's what led to a lot of the complications later. Um, next next picture, please. Yeah, so so the so the the Norman uh, monarchs of England they'd um, they had fantasized 
about absorbing Ireland into their orbit ever since William I. We know William I, uh, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, William I uh, was, was just the, the, if he'd survived one more year, he would have conquered Ireland completely um, without even having to invade it, uh, according to the Anglo-Saxon Con Chronicle. What that means, we have no idea. But um, it sort of it meant that he, he he thought it was perfectly within his capability to do so. Um, William the Second he didn't didn't last very long on the throne, but but he he said he was going to gather all the ships in England and he was going to make build a bridge of of them across the Irish Sea and invade Ireland on it. Um, well, good luck to him if he tried that. I'm sure it would have ended disastrously. But um, but he he never got round to doing it either. And his successor Henry Henry the first was tangled up with with a whole lot of internal struggles and couldn't couldn't really do anything about it. Um, However, we know that Anglo-Norman adventurers may even have reached Ireland in, in the 1100s um, under the earliest Earl of Pembroke, uh, who's known as uh, De Montgomery. And um, you probably recognize that name, um, but, um, but, but he, um, uh, if, if they were, well, we know that they were there because they fled. There was a squabble, internal squabble in the in the Anglo Norman Kingdom, and and they were rebels and they fled to Ireland where they had some alliances with Irish Irish kings, um, but they but they but they didn't really make any, anything of that and they came back um, once uh, Henry had given them a pardon. Um, the, the, um, however, this all changes, um, with, with the, uh, with the, with the, with the deposition of Dermot McMurrah, who you can see, um, whether this is a real image of him or not. It's from, uh, Gerald of Wales's Conquest of Ireland, and it is supposed to show um, Dermot McMurray with a with a typical axe, which the Irish um, nobility uh, were proficient with at the time. No, it was derived from an, an um, Viking type axe, uh, and it was known as a spar. But anyway, um, uh, he he was. Now, Dermot McMurray was the overking of the Leyen, if you remember, or, or Linster. Now, um, if you remember, we talked about them earlier. They, they, there was a new dynasty, in, and he was from that dynasty, the E. Hensley. Um, and, um, and, and he had, um, uh, and he lost his throne. Now, how he lost his throne is a little bit interesting. We'll just briefly sketch that. Um, he lost his throne because he ran off with um, the O'Rourke, um, the, the, the king of O'Rourke um, of Brefne, which, which we had a look at in the map. Um, he had a, a, had a, a missus or wife and, 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 and uh, Dermot abducted her. Um, a bit, she's seen as being the Helen of Troy of, of, of Ireland. It's not exactly true. She was actually quite a bit older than, uh, than Dermot. Um, and um, we're not sure to what degree she was a willing, a willing accomplice in this or not. Um, but anyway, he ran off with her, her name was Der Villa. And um, that started up, uh, um, that angered both the King of Connacht, who was very powerful, if you remember Rory O'Connor, the son of Turlough, and, and the O'Rourke's, and they all went after 
um, after, after Dermot, and Dermot was defeated in battle, and the, and the other chiefs of, of, uh, of Linster said, well, why have we got this guy in, in King, King? He's just causing trouble, uh, and, uh, and we're not getting anything out of it. We're just getting, getting our asses kicked. And um, so, so they just decided to depose him, which was the normal normal thing in 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 to do in 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 um, in Irish society at the time. If you had a lord who was mean and exacting, or was doing crazy things like Dermot and so on and so forth. Um, then, then they didn't last long. They were, um, they were, they were kicked out of out of office pretty quick. And this is what happened to Dermot. So Dermot, uh, I've so written eleven sixty seven. He actually was deposed in eleven sixty six, but um, in in eleven sixty seven he went over to. Um, he was in he was in England by then, or or no, not in England. Sorry, in 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 Wales, and um, he he in, there he teamed up with um, Richard de Clare, who is known in our uh, as he was known by the nickname Strongbow, and he was the Earl of Earl of Earl of Pembroke, which is in the um, in that bit of of. Uh, of Wales at the south of it, which juts out into the Irish Sea, and um, and uh, these Anglo-Norman lords of southern Wales were were pretty much independent of of the crown, and uh, and they were busy est establishing frontier marches. Um, Beyond the boundaries of England, and uh, with the with the uh, and there was always a threat, as far as the English king was concerned, that these people would would start to set themselves up as lords, independent lords in their own right. This is a big a big problem with with feudalism, especially with the system of primogenitorship, which doesn't exist in Ireland. They they had um, they had a, uh, what's known as a set system. Which was um, which allowed for for you had to have several sons and they would all have an equal chance of of, in, of, of inheritance and they would be granted um, land, whatever. Um, in 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 the feudal system, if you're a younger son or you're an illegitimate son, you're out and you've got to try and make your own way in the world. And um, if you're a warrior, well, you do it by conquest. So, so, um, so Dermot went running off to Richard de Clare or Strongbow, and um, he's sort of known. If anybody is in the audience is from South America, you you probably you probably heard or Central America, you probably heard of. The, of somebody called Malinche. <laughs> um, Malinche um, is, is sort of seen as being the archetypal traitor, <laughs> if you like. Um, and Dermot uh, sort of falls into that, into that character because he was, he was basically trying to um, advance his own cause. Um, he had serious problems uh, making himself popular back home because he was, he was breaking all the rules um, of Irish kingship at the time. And, um, and then he, mar he married off his daughter to, 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 um, to Strongbow. Now, in Irish terms, that really didn't, didn't mean very much. It was just a way of cementing an alliance. But in feudal terms of inheritance, it meant that if something happened to, to, to Dermot, then um, Strongbow could claim 
to be the king of Leinster. And this is exactly what he did, because uh, um, no sooner had Strongbow arrived with his, his knights, you can see them all landing there in the, in the, in the picture at the, at the bottom there. Um, no sooner had he, had he arrived, you see, they, they had a huge technological advantage over the, over, over the local people. They were clad from head to foot in metal um, armor. Irish hardly wore any armor, even nobles, as you can see in the picture. Um, and really, they just bonged a few spears at each other and they had these axes. Um, and that was, that was pretty much it. Um, the, the Norman knights were mounted on big horses, big heavy horses. Um, they were clad in head to foot in, in armor. They had, they had, um, they had long swords, they had maces, they had lances, long lances things like this here, and they charged at the gallop. And, um, and they were supported by some Welsh foot soldiers uh, who, were, um, who, who were armed, armed with bows, and not just ordinary bows. These, these were the forerunners to the English, English longbow. Um, these are very powerful, very powerful bows. And the... Um, and, and so, so um, as I say, Strongbow made an immediate claim to Dermot's throne through his wife. Um, the, the Irish uh, method of selecting a new monarch was sort of democratic in that it was, um, it was a selection made by, you know, when, when a king died, then, then the, the local leading families at least all met together and they just and they had a cast a vote and decided who was the next person. Um, and then this this foreigner who's arrived and has been throwing his weight about in the country uh, uh, in support of of, of Dermot, uh, who is unpopular anyway, and um, uh, suddenly says, "No, no, no, um, I." I'm king now, and and your your system of selection could go to hell, and and that's exactly what he did, and um, and so so he um, he established him, him himself as as the king of Leinster. He was attacked then by the O'Connors of Connor, uh, who raised a big army from various parts of Ireland to, to go and defeat him. They camped outside uh, Dublin um, to threaten because the, the Normans, the Anglo Normans were especially interested in securing the towns that, that this was where they intended to grab hold of first. They'd first taken Wexford um, and and then, and then they, and then they, um, and then they moved to Waterford, and and to Dublin, especially. And, and Dublin was seen as being the most important uh, town in 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 Ireland at the time. And um, but uh, the the army of the High King of Ireland arrived outside and said, uh, hang, about, "Hang about a minute, you're not welcome here." Um, let's let's have a um, you know either you get out or we have some sort of a parley or whatever. So Strongbow entered into into negotiations with with Rory O'Connor, and Rory O'Connor was thinking, oh, oh, okay, then that that's all right then. Uh, we can we can we can relax. It's all going to be sorted out, and as soon as as soon as the Irish army started to relax and they were sort of bathing and and uh, um, and carousing and and so on and so forth and uh, let down their watch, um, that's when the Normans came charging out of Dublin and routed the entire army of the High King. 
Uh, now, this was not, not on, only, only being noticed in Ireland. This has also been noticed in England. And Henry II of the Angevin Empire, which is, as I say, was this enormous, this large, large um, feudal, feudal um, domain, um, including England, uh, Orge, Normandy, Anjou, Brittany, and, and Aquitaine. Um, and as well, Southern Wales, um, was suddenly getting a bit worried about this guy's strongbow. Um, why, was he going to set himself up as an independent, in, um, independent king? Plus, of course, as we, all, as we know from, from uh, what I've been explaining earlier, the, the other, his predecessors were we're obviously thinking about expanding into Ireland anyway. So he thought, oh, well, kill two birds with one stone. I'll go over and reassert my authority over, over Mr. Strongbow. So he, um, he, 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 he got a fleet together and he, um, uh, in 1171, um, Henry II of the Angevin Empire landed in Ireland um, it, it, in October of that year after the battle where the High King had been defeated at Dublin. And he asserted his authority over the independent ambitions of Strongbow. So Strongbow must have been thinking, oh, rats, it's him again. Um, he's come with a much bigger army. And so I'll have to show my fealty to him and so on and so forth. So, and and um, one of the things Henry II did was he took he took the um, he he put his son uh, John Lackland, who is later known as uh, John the First of England, um, but he's known as Lackland because he didn't have any lands um, at the time, uh, and. And he was given he was given the uh, the Henry's Henry's possessions in Ireland as his his lordship, um, and um, and before Henry left Ireland, he he received the fealty of fifteen Irish kings, who were probably, um, as I say, in Ireland. Fealty didn't really mean very much. It, it just meant you were giving tribute to somebody, and as soon as their back was turned, you would, you would, um, or as soon as they had a, um, they, their power lessened for five minutes, then you say, "Oh well, I'm, I'm independent again." Um, so, of course, in, in feudal terms, that a fealty meant was a binding contract, and um, and these these kings. Presumably, just thought, oh, oh, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just make, make, um, a temporary, temporary agreement, and um, to, to pay, to pay uh, homage to, to this new, new guy. But, but once he's his back's turned, I'll, I'll, I'll have him. Um, this was going to be a big, um, a big cultural cultural difference between the two the two um the, the two types of society from this point onwards um okay i think we can probably move to the next one now yeah so um so this is um uh, if you uh, look at the picture on the on the um, on, on the left there, that that's uh, that's a uh, Irish. I mean, I'm not Irish, but um, that's an, a, a Norman or Frankish knight, round about twelve hundred odd, eleven ninety maybe, eleven eighty, eleven ninety, something like this. Um, around the same time as the Cru Third Crusade. Um, and, um, and as you can see, the, the knights were not only fully clad in heavy mail, covering all extremities, they also had, um, 
their helmets with uh, attached face guards. And then over the next century, the, these helmets developed into what's known as pot helms, so which were like, uh, like, like a, a big barrel on top of your head and um, are made of metal and with slits in it. And um, while for the body uh, solid plate attachment reinforcements were added, um, and even, even the war horses started to be armored. And um, such, such equipment combined with the ever expanding courtly extravagances that, that were required of a knight and all the, all the um, regalia which he had to, had to buy and which he had to acquire in order to, to take part in the, in the courtly um, rituals of the, of the knight. Um, they, they were becoming rapidly un, unaffordable. Before this time, the knight was a fairly rough and ready sort of person, but they were becoming ex, it, it, um, increasingly effete and, um, and, and also the, the um, amount of equipment that they had and uh, the vir virtually impregnable um, in, in battle. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and this all cost money, so their numbers started to decline, and um, they were increasingly replaced by horsemen of lesser status, uh, known as men at arms, um, who didn't who didn't have to at least, even if they paid for the for for most of the equipment. Um, or if their their equipment might be sp supplied by the lord, you see the by by the big by the big chiefs, the duke or count or whatever um, would supply them with the with the armor, and uh, and they wouldn't have to take part in all the jousting and the and the courting the ladies and all this sort of stuff because because that wasn't really their game. Um, you can see the Welsh. Um, guy at the bottom, he's um, he, this is a Welsh archer who's the most common type of foot soldier in, found in the Anglo Norman armies of this period. Um, they were armed with very powerful elm bows, not yew bows like the English long bow, but uh, still, they must have been very powerful weapons. In fact, we know that they were, they could pin a man even through male armor. So, um, that that otherwise they they were as likely as equipped as the Irish more or less. I mean they they didn't have any armor either, and just a knife or something they carried. And um and and great numbers of such troops were hired to support the knights in their in their wars of conquest. Now interestingly, there's a very common surname in Ireland, which is Walsh. It originally means Welsh, and it's 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 um speculated that that um, its prevalence, where it's, it's found all over Ireland pretty much. Uh, in most parts of Ireland, you'll find this name Walsh. And um, it's, it could derive from those Welsh soldiers who stayed on and intermarried with local women. Um, so, so the Anglo-Norman um, conquistadores, and it's it's it is actually quite an apt term because they did act, they did behave like conquistadores, um, and they run, run ran riot for a couple of years until until the Henry the Second arrived, and then as soon as he was out of the country, they carried on running riot, um, and and they were. Um, and they and they did pretty well. They didn't do entirely that well. The the Irish were able to get get um, get their own back. Uh, the High King you know, Warrior um, he actually won a a battle quite early on against uh, Strongbow uh, at at Turles in um, in County Tipperary. Uh, in which he nearly he nearly drove the English out, out of the country altogether, but but they recovered um, thanks to to Henry actually bringing in 
his his son and um, the reinforcements. And um, and the the um, uh, and the and, and the conflict between the Anglo Normans and the Irish continued. Um, but as I say, the, the Irish sort of got to learn. You know, if you if you hid in the woods and you jumped out from behind the trees at these people, um, it sort of took away some of the advantage of their heavy armor and their um, and their uh, cavalry charges and um, so on and so forth. They're shooting people down with arrows, and um, so uh, and then. And then you could use your, your axis at close quarters because the axis would go straight through the heavy armor as well. And um, in addition to that, the um, many of the early castles, the earliest castles, because they, they were just basically stockades really, um, what's known as Mott and Bailey castles. And um, so they were sort of pretty rough and ready fortifications. And we know that the Irish burned down several of these um, just shortly after they'd been put up. So it wasn't entirely one-sided battle, but it was fairly one-sided. I mean, the, the, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of Ireland uh, falls under uh, long-lasting um, Anglo-Norman Inference, especially in Leinster, outside the Wicklow Mountains, because the Wicklow Mountains they couldn't get in there, and there wasn't much to drag them in there anyway in the first place. Um, there wasn't much to, to go in there after, and so the Irish continued to hang around there. But um, in the um, and in the the province of Leash as well. Um, the Irish also um, uh, were able to, to fortify themselves uh, because of the bogs in Leash. Um, and in, in the far west of, of southwest of Ireland and in the far west of Ireland in Connemara um, and in the um, what's now Kerry and West Cork. Um, highlands, um, the the Irish were still were able to recover, and in in Ulster in the north, um, although the the um, the east uh, eastern eastern Ulster was conquered by a family known as or a dynasty known as the De Courcys, uh, Anglo Norman Anglo Norman dynasty. Um, the the um the 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 rest of Ulster or the, the north of Ireland remained completely independent of the Anglo Normans, and the Normans the Anglo Normans didn't get any any penetration there. But in Munst, in in the rest of Munster and Leinster, and um, it, in Meath. Where the southern Inyale were completely wiped out by the by the arriving Anglo Normans, um, and also in quite a large part of Connacht, but but this was all yet to to develop um, because um, Henry Henry set up in 1175. He wanted a Treaty of Windsor, which he, and the Treaty of Windsor divided Ireland into two. Um, with John agreed as Henry's regent, his feudal regent in the Anglo-Norman east of the country, and Rory O'Connor was acknowledged as the independent king of, Ga of, of the Gaelic Irish in the west. That didn't last very long. In fact, it, 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 hardly, it was hardly the ink had dried on the paper before it was being broken again, and the Anglo-Normans were once again on the rampage. Um, and um, very shortly, uh, Henry was um, distracted by developments in France and the um, in his other domains over there, and the and the treaty wasn't worth the parchment it was it it was written on, 
Um, so the attempts by Anglo Norman lords to conquer more territories for themselves continued apace into the late 12th and uh, mid to late 12th, 13th centuries, with general success in the more fertile and easily accessible parts of the, of the island. Um, and then the conquest stalled, and we'll have a look at why that was shortly. Um, in the interim, we're going to have a look at um, a certain figure, which we go to the next picture for. Yeah, so, so this, this is our main source of a lot of uh, high medieval um, things about Ireland that we, or records of Ireland that we have. Um, now, this was written by a guy called Gerald of Wales, um, who, who was, um, he, he's our main source, as I say, for 12th century, 12th century in Ireland. He's a very complicated figure um, in that he was uh, mixed um, Norman and Welsh descent. Now, he's known as actually three names that Gerald of Wales is the, is the most um accessible one Giraldus Cambrensis is the is the Latin term for him um and then um and then the other one he's known as is is, is like what he would have called himself which is um Gerald de Barry um because he was actually from from Barry in in southern Wales uh which is quite near Cardiff um which is a new um, Anglo-Norman fief, and he was he was the son of the local local um, uh, lord there, De Barry, and um, and he became a, a highly learned. Um, but his mother was was um, was Welsh. Uh, she was a Welsh descended from Welsh royalty, actually Welsh prince princess. And um, he became a highly, highly learned clergyman. And he even visited Rome and he met the Pope. Um, I'm not sure which Pope he met, but um, he, he certainly met one of them. It might have been Adrian IV or it might have been Alexander. We, I'm not entirely sure. But um, his ambition was to was to uh, secure the uh, Bishop of St. David's in southern Wales, but this was thwarted because by um, his mixed ancestry because the, the uh, they were quite determined. The early Anglo Normans were quite determined that anybody who wasn't Anglo Norman didn't didn't get anywhere in the it was a little bit racist in fact um didn't get anywhere in there um in the scheme of things so so he never got there until he was dead and you can see his image there that 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 was um he never got the bishopric but he he has a now statue in saint david's cathedral and that that shows it there and um he made two um, two two visits um, to Ireland, um, and he he wrote he wrote two books, as I say, one called the Conquest of Ireland, the other one called the Topography of Ireland, um, which is a little bit of a misnomer. But um, he visited in the eleven eighties, which is shortly after the the Normans really got into swing in in Ireland. Um, and um, the former and more famous of the two is divided into three parts. So the, the first part is a description of Ireland's geography, its flora and fauna. Um, and the, the, the um, second part is an account of alleged miracles and marvels. And the third part is, uh, is, an ethnography, is the first ethnography and history of 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 the people from the point of view of an outsider. Unfortunately, Gerald um, was was um, obviously quite racist in his 
approach to the Irish and, and he um, very prejudiced. And um, I'll give you an example in a minute. But um, and he he um, his his um, his Right, sorry about that. Um, hello, hello, can can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. It keeps on uh, uh, muting me for some reason. Anyway, so so these um, images and the and the uh, and the script from the from from the books are quite nice. So I thought I'd in introduce them to you, um, despite the nature of the of the content of some of them. Some of them. But this, the, he was he was he was very much uh, interested in. In wildlife and in um, and in natural beauty, which was his commendary, um, and um, here you can see he was he, he was fascinated. The first time he'd seen um, white-throated divers, and uh, you can see one of them on the on the right there, um, which he drew or had drawn into his book. I'm not sure if he drew it himself or whether it was um, another scribe who did that. I'm not quite sure about that. Anyway, um, we can now move on to the next picture, which is another image from his book. Yeah, well, you've got two images here from his book, actually. Um, and as I say, I'm just I'm just uh, introducing these. These are sort of high medieval um, artwork, and it, it, and they are quite quite interesting. This is this is from the second part of the topography of Ireland. The image on the left. It's supposed to show an Irish saint with um, two werewolves, um, and it's it's quite obvious from from uh, from from. Gerald's account. He was quite gullible, and he actually believed these stories and. Uh, and he stuck them in, um, and um, so anyway, that's 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 an image image from that, which is which is still quite a nice nice image, I must say. And then and then on the on the right, you can see one of the Irish lords, which is from uh, from an image from the conquest of Ireland, and that's actually M Morris Fitzgerald, who was one of the Anglo Norman conquerors of Ireland. Okay, we'll have the 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 next picture, please. Right now, this is the this is where it gets um, dodgy with this one. Um, now, this is supposed to show um, uh, the coronation of an Irish king, 
the coronation ritual of an Irish king. Now, uh, we know that this is highly unlikely to have happened. Uh, what the king is supposed to be doing is he's supposed to be, he's supposed to have um, had sexual intercourse with the, with the, with a the horse. Then the horse is killed and chopped up into, into pieces. And, and the, uh, and the king gets in the, in a bath of blood from the, from the horse that he's had sexual intercourse with. And then all his, um, his followers and his, um, his subjects, they, they, um, they, they eat all the, all the innards of the, of the, um, of the horse. I think uh, it's it's um it's it's not really a credible a credible story. It seems to be just just a, um, an attempt to to denigrate the Irish. I'll give you I'll give you an example of of he, of 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 um, what he wrote, what he was writing. Uh, I've got a quote here. I mean, Gerald of Wales can in fact unfortunately be sort of seen as the um as possibly the first settler colonial propagandist of history um he writes this people then talking about the irish they are truly barbarous being not only barbarous in their dress but suffering their hair and beards to grow enormously in an uncouth manner just like the modern fashion recently introduced. Indeed, all their habits are barbarisms, but habits are formed by mutual intercourse. And as these people inhabit a country so remote from the rest of the world and lying at its furthest extremity, forming as it were another world, and are thus excluded from civilized nations, they think nothing and practice nothing but their barbarism with which they are born and bred and which sticks to them like a second nature. Whatever natural gifts they possess are excellent. In whatever requires industry, they are worthless. So, so this is sort of setting up, this is actually setting up, um, especially to do with how England has traditionally looked upon our Irish people. Um, uh, it's it started to set up a narrative, a uh, settler colonial narrative, and this is why Gerald of Wales, unfortunately, despite his um, the other other sides to his writings, which are quite interesting, um, and and some some respects quite quite beautiful. Um, this this aspect to it really sets him up as being a one of the first propagandists of the settler colonial mentality in relation to Ireland. Okay, we can we can um, move on to the next picture. Right. Okay. So we're going to be talking a little bit about castles and uh, these sort of things at the moment. Right now, this this little picture on the right here, this this shows a typical rude residence um, that was set up by a minor um, Anglo-Irish lord or knight on the on the Irish marches and the Irish frontier, um, and uh, would, would they, they would have been built in this makeshift uh, Mott and Bailey style on the right. The mott part of the of the construction is the, is the high bit. So so this is the um, it was usually built on a high earthen mound, which was to dominate the local countryside. But um, in this case, um, it's been built on a crag, uh, which which one could easily take advantage of if there were if it just happened to be. Uh, convenient crag in the in the area, 
um, then you could build your mot there. But normally it was built on top of um, of a of a mound which had been dug out of the out of the soil around about. Um, the bailey part um, that below the mot that that's that's um, again it's a sort of ditch stockaded it's all very improvised and very thrown thrown together at this stage in particular um and it contained the outbuildings the workshops and the residences the lord his household retainers and the servants so um so as as you can see um this this was pretty rough and ready stuff Later on, I was actually going to introduce um, another picture here, but I've, I've seems like I've forgotten to put it in. But um, this was uh, Dundrum Castle in, in County Down, which is made famous through um, a series on, um, uh, is, it, is it Netflix? The um, Game of Thrones and all this, um, HBO, HBO is it? Can't remember. Anyway, um, Dundrum is what is a is a typical example of what this 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 type of castle or fortification would have developed into later on. You would have replaced the the palisades with with um, stone towers, and you put crenellations on the on the on the walls, rather stone walls. Uh, you put in a few towers. The, the the watchtower uh the the crude watchtower the the far end would become a big big um a big keep and um and the and the bailey part would be would be be the outer ring of the walls um by this point so um although although dundrum isn't in this i'll, I'll probably stick it in the next one because uh, it's 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 um it's convenient um and um then this one this 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 picture here now um this is uh i, I just wanted to show you coats of arms basically so the lordship of ireland which i was talking about set up by henry henry the second of england um, and the Angevin Empire. That is the 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 image on the right, with the three crowns and the and the blue um, blue background. That that is the is the is the is the shield or the coat of arms of the Lordship of Ireland. Now, as you can see, if if any of you know anything about Irish provincial flags it bears quite a lot of resemblance to the monst what's known as the monster flag and uh, indeed there are connections there um but but that was that was the uh, that one is the lordship of ireland this guy in the middle is again from gerald of wales's books he seems to be quite happy quite um uh uh he seems to be quite predisposed to to having the image of somebody dressed in in um, civilian clothes drawing a sword out of the sheath. Um, uh, that that is Hugh de Lacey. Now Hugh de Lacey is quite important. Um, he's he's what he's he's the guy who conquers um, the O'Neill ter the southern O'Neill territories. The, some of the richest and best lands in Ireland, just outside Dublin. Now, he conquers all of those. Um, and you can see his shield, his coat of arms is on the, is on the left. Now, what's interesting about that coat of arms is that there's a black bar across it. Um, that actually meant, the black bar meant that it, he was um, illegitimate. Uh, a recognized illegitimate son um, because you could be non-recognized or you could be recognized. Um, 
Now, he was also connected to another, uh, to a big family in England um, who also owned loads of land in England. Um, he was, he was the, 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 the English, English, um, the English de Lacy's owned um, land ar around in the Welsh marches and up into Lancashire and, and the forest of Boland. Okay, next picture. Yeah. So this is this is De Lacy's castle. Um, this is the biggest castle in Ireland. It's it's called the um, the Tr Trim Castle. If you, you, we, we saw that in the first picture, and uh, and this is where where uh, where De Lacy would have would have had the his the, his headquarters. As you can see, it's quite a. This is um. Is probably um, this reflects uh, an artist's um, impression of what it would have looked like, say, roughly probably about 1250, something like this, the middle of the 13th century, um, and and as you can see, it has um, it has a big keep in the middle of it, and it has bastions and it has um, towers, square towers and round towers. Um, and a big gatehouse, and um, and a moat around it, and um, so quite a quite a substantial, substantial um, fortress, and very impregnable as well. And several of the of these sort of type of build of constructions were being built all over Ireland at, at this time um, by the by by each Anglo Norman lord. Um, uh, who was an earl wanted to to um, to to uh, it, to express express his his wealth and his power through building a castle like that. Um, uh, so so Hugh de Lacy was uh, an example of an Anglo Norman success story. Um, but of course, there were many other families that are uh, very famous. There was the Fitzgeralds, who were in the south, and, and the Roche as well, and the, and the de Courcys, who went into eastern Ulster in the north, and um, the Butlers and the Burks, who established themselves all over um, Connacht and, and Munster. So, um, so that's 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 those ones. We can probably move on to the next picture now. Yeah. So this is a um, this is a a typical Anglo-Norman town. Um, so, as I say, by the 13th century, they they're starting to build up these very strong stone uh, complex fortifications around them. Um, the, the towns are becoming big centers of commerce and they're spring up all over the place. This is New Ross. You might think, oh, this is uh, medieval Dublin. It's not. This is, um, this is New Ross, um, which is it's a relatively small town today in, in, in County Wexford. Um, and um, and it certainly wasn't Wexford Wexford Town, um, so qu quite a quite a small place by by medieval standards. I mean, you lots of towns like this, of course, were set being set up across England, for instance, and 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 in France and various other places, but. Um, and, and the guilds and so on and so forth were all, all working in these places. They were mostly settled colonial um, settlements. So most English people, we, 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 we know that this because um, we, have, we have some poetry that was written in Wexford and it's not written in art, um, it's written in English. Um, 
and and that that is quite um, quite significant. Um, the the um, so so that 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 sort of gives you an idea of the typical like small to medium sized towns that were springing up all over the Norman controlled parts of Ireland. Um, and I'll just just before we move picture, I'll say um, there was uh, it sort of bears a slight resemblance to to early um, to Dublin. Well, Dublin was much bigger by this point anyway, but um, all the Irish in Dublin had been kicked out of the, out of the town. Even the Norse Irish, they were kicked out to a place called which is now known as Oxman's Town, which is um, which is now within well within Dublin, but um, at, at the time it wasn't. It was like being kicked outside the city walls, um, and that's that is called Oxman's Town because Ostman's Town or Eastman's Town, meaning meaning the Viking. Um, or people of Viking descent, Irish people of Viking descent, were forced to live there. So they kicked out of the town, and the English people, um, the English settlers, took over over their over their houses. Um, I'm sure we can think of some some uh, um, some examples um, from our modern modern times of some things like that going on. In our in in the contemporary world, um, and um, so we can move on to the next picture. Yeah, so this is uh, Kilkenny. Uh, the first uh, picture shows Kilkenny under construction. You can see a Romanesque. Um, I'll be talking about Romanesque in a minute. Um, now you see an Irish tower there, a round tower. That's that's from the previous period. Um, it's still in existence there, but um, but the this new Roman type style of architecture, uh, which is all part of the Gregorian reforms, and uh, and it's all part of the um, of the the um, Anglo Anglo Norman ar architecture is being constructed, and as you can see, the 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 original original monastery is being completely swamped out by this new being built in its in in its place. Um, the picture on the right is what this might have looked like, say, round about um, maybe. It's possibly a bit later. It's probably around about 1400. The um, next picture. I'm saying that because there seems to be round holes in in the um, just where they could have stuck uh, very light cannon out of. So, but but still, it, it gives you an idea of the sort of late later medieval 13th 13th to 15th century uh, uh, town of of Kilkenny, that's 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 roughly what it would probably look look like. So you've got a, the big castle over there in the background. You've got the abbey, which is um, now expanded much beyond that. It's it's over on the, on the left, and then you've got the the main street there um, with the with the houses, and you've got the 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 very very and impregnable walls. Okay, we can have the next picture. Yeah, so this is this is what was going on in churches. Um, now this is Clonfert. Um, this is St. Brendan's Cathedral at Clonfert. And this is a very good example of a Romanesque church. As you can see, Romanesque style is not like the Gothic style that we placed it. It's, it's much more, simple and um, and sort of solid as it were in in, in appearance what what is really interesting about about the um, about the the Romanesque style is not only its simplicity but its archways which you can see in the picture on the right there 
Um, the, they, ha they have these rather spectacular archways. Um, uh, and, and the one at St. Brendan's is particularly uh, interesting. And these were all built under the, um, uh, the, the um, donations made but de donations made to the church to the uh, to the by the by these anglo anglo norman lords so you're starting to see quite a uh, a strange relationship is developing between the irish uh, catholic or, or the the Catholic Church in Ireland and the um, and the uh, and the conquerors. Um, now this is this is quite this. We'll talk about this more as the series progresses. Um, but but this is this is um, where it's sort of um, the the um, the church in Ireland sort of falls between two stools. Uh, it's it's neither one thing nor another, and on one one level, it's quite happy for the Anglo Normans, for instance, to come in and start throwing their weight about, um, because it serves serves their purpose of introducing the Gregorian forms. Um, but it um, it also means that, to a certain degree, the the church is actually in league with the, with the foreigners, which is is always a big problem for it. Um, right, we'll have the, have the next next picture, please. The last one, um, which you, as you notice is the same picture we had earlier on. Uh, what I want to do in this one is to concentrate on the one, on the picture on, on the right rather than the picture on the left. So we can see, we can see the huge difference. You see the green areas are, are all that is left um, at the round about 1300, all that is left of um, areas con controlled um, by the directly by the by the native Ar Irish. So you've got County Clare, the the O'Briens are there, the O'Flaherty's in Connemara, um, just north of that. Um, you have the McCarthy's in the in the West Cork and Kerry, um, and you have the O'Neills, who are um, descended from the Inye, um, and they they are are still dominating most of of Ulster, but the rest of the country has pretty much been conquered. And as you can see from the pictures, um, you can see that that um, it's been quite extensively anglified. Um, so there are English towns, there are um, basically English, English English speaking towns, and um, there are there are um, castles, extensive castles, and um, there are roads and there are are um, uh, ships of the of the of the period are are going around to doing all sorts of trade, um, so so the, it seems as though England has successfully conquered most of Ireland, and and the rest of it will all just be mopped up quickly. This does not happen. Um, now, why doesn't it happen? Well, we can touch on that. I'll be talking about it more in the next one, but I'll, I'll, I will explain a little bit of it. Um, an All-Ireland Parliament is held for the first time in, in the year 1297. Um, and English settlement of the territory they can secure in their towns and their castles continues apace until after 1300. And then it starts to fall. And basically, I won't, I won't explain too much, but um, shall we say epidemics have some have a part to play. 
Um, that that again has some mo modern modern connotations to it, and in addition to that, um, uh, famine has a has a has a has a part to play. War has a part to play, um, and climate change has a part to play. So we'll be discussing all that at the next at the next session. Um, and it leads eventually to a resurgence of um, a near total assimilation of all the Irish territories and, their, um, and the culture and everything else outside the Pale, which is the area around Dublin, basically. So, so that is, is um, how I'm going to leave it now, and we can have a discussion uh, from now on.